So please welcome back Barry Jenkins. Yeah, that's perfect. Also, the film's editor, Joy McMillan. There she is. Woohoo! And cinematographer James Laxton. Woo! Have a seat, have a seat. Wow. I'm surrounded by Oscar nominees and winners. This is just awesome. <laughs> So Barry, you mentioned at the top that you all met in film school. So take us back to those days. Where exactly, how exactly did you meet? And did you have any idea that you would still, because I think I heard you say back there that you go back to 2000? Yep, the year 2000, yeah, 22 years ago. <laughs> there are some people in this room who maybe weren't born when we met, we're old. <laughs> which is crazy. Uh, but yeah, we were all at Florida State and uh, James came in from San Francisco, and then Joy came in, and Joy didn't like me at first, <laughs> but, but me and James hit it off, like, right away, okay. right away. <laughs> we, we, were the, we were the kids uh, watching all the weird movies, uh, me and James, uh, and then somehow, some way, I just got fused to Joy, uh, but it was cool, man. It was, uh, it was a really good time. Uh-huh. So, uh, now you have to talk about him. What were your first impressions of Barry? Well, Barry liked to tell people that I didn't like him. Oh, well, yeah, but he didn't like me. <laughs> <laughs> she might be telling the truth. She might be. <laughs> um, but I remember Barry was um, very quiet, very observant, and um, the way that he would process things that we were doing in film school was very interesting. Like, he wanted to, in, to understand, like, the ins and outs of everything. Um, and I think that's kind of how, when we started working um, together, it was this whole process where he was always very inclusive, no matter what department you're working on. Um, and he always, you know, sought your opinion as we were going through. But it was very interesting. James and Barry are very much exactly the same <laughs> as they were then very uh <laughs> you don't think so i don't know yeah. <laughs> i hope i do a little basically she's saying we haven't matured in 22 yeah, yeah. years exactly. <laughs> no but um very i think um barry and james were kind of like this yin and yang they were like joined at the hip when they were working together and um i remember one time i was the production designer on barry's uh F3 project, uh, My Josephine. And I was like, you know what? I always like to present Barry with options, just so he feels like I really did my work. And so um, I was showing them curtains that were gonna be in the house. And I had like a curtain from Target, a curtain from Walmart, and this very like vintage cu curtain that I'd found at Goodwill. And I showed it to them and they're like, well, obviously it's curtain three. And I was like, well, I wanted to show you guys options. And James is like, you could have just started with curtain three. <laughs> And I think God. that's kind of how they were. <laughs> so you're saying I was always a jerk, is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> I was just saying, yeah, no, I, I remember it's something that all I would just uh, emphasize was just that it was such a kind of a tight group of uh, young wannabe filmmakers. Um, it was a small class, and it was a really just like a real family kind of mentality, and I think it's kind of the same kind of sensation of the feel like even you know today making movies with these guys wow so let's talk about how that family dynamic came together on this film and uh, you know at the academy museum we spent a lot of time thinking about craft and so i really hope that we can get a little bit nerdy and talk about some of the specific stylistic decisions that you made in this film because watching it again tonight I, I don't even fully understand how I'm being moved in the ways that I am. I think it's a testament to the incredible work that you all and your team did. So Barry, maybe we can start by talking about what kinds of visual cues you were thinking about as you were writing the script, um, and what were some of those touchstones that you really felt were gonna be important for visualizing this story? Uh, yeah, uh, a lot of it was, because uh, the piece originated with uh, Terrell, with Terrell's piece in Moonlight, Black Boys Look Blue, look blue. so the word is already there. 
And so Terrell had written uh, a lot of the, the sounds. Uh, the ocean was something that was very prominent in his piece. Um, and then this idea of the color blue and us being from the same place, from Miami, those things were, were kind of there. Um, and they were like genuine feelings. And so when I was adapting the thing into uh, the script that we ultimately ended up making, I tried to keep as much of that stuff uh, uh, with me. Uh, the other part of it was just knowing we were going to cast three different actors to play the same character about, you know, with James and I, how do we frame these, uh, these, these characters or these actors in very similar or exactly the same ways so that as you're going through the story, you know, the shoulders of the actors are, are literally changing mm -hmm. as you advance from chapter to chapter, but the framing is the same. So if the framing, the thing you're viewing them through is the same, that's the control, then obviously their differences is going to be how you can really tell, you know, how their arc is developing, you know, how their their inner life is uh, is evolving. And uh, I don't know, but we didn't try to be too literal with it because this is a single camera show. We didn't we didn't have any uh, uh, double camera days, and we did it in 25 days, and so we had to move really fast. And so a lot of it was just I mean, this shit was the wild wild west, man. <laughs> <laughs> single camera means you. James. Yeah, yeah, me. Which, uh, no, I, I'm, I'm in, I sometimes miss those days, in fact. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, what I remember a lot of things about it, but something that I feel shaped me coming to the project and sort of shaped some early decisions was, you know, like anything else, it starts with a script, but just when reading it, feeling how, how powerful Chiron's emotions wanted to, when it were, and w for me, it was just important to sort of depict them with, you know, a similar amount of strength and power and 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 um, a lot of that was uh, I think part of our decision to shoot anamorphic was was part of that in some regard I say just to try to make some real bold strong powerful images it felt like um, I mean to get geeky <laughs> uh, it just felt like I think that choice shaped a lot of things actually and uh, that's you know some early memories for me anyway it was just sort of wanting to make sure that Chiron's sort of um, well his journey but his I guess for in particular, his emotional journey mm. wanted to feel like it was being betrayed with the same amount of emotional volume that he was experiencing. Mm. Yeah, I was gonna say, it's interesting to hear you say that because mm. this shit's so long ago. <laughs> you know, it means we shot it seven years ago or six years ago, if it's the fifth anniversary of the Oscars, a year in release, a year in the can. So maybe it's like, I guess at least six years. But uh, we did make some hard choices in the beginning, like the anamorphic format, shooting with those, was it Hawks that we yeah. used? Mm -hmm. Which are really aggressive, focus-wise, uh, because Chiron's in the center, but the world around him is a, is a bit blurred, was just the general idea. But then we get there, and we just have to just do shit. Like, the swimming scene kind of just had to happen because the storm was coming in. I even, I heard the intro, the, the, uh, an the opening of the movie with the 360 shot, wasn't meant to be the opening of the movie, wasn't meant to be a one -er. It was like literally the night before, James and I said, hey shit, you know, I think we should maybe try and do that as a one -er. <laughs> Never met the Steadicam guy, ever. <laughs> Low budget film, so there was no way to meet the Steadicam guy before. Mm. We show up, you go, hey, we want to do this. It's like, <laughs> just, just one little thing. The guy's like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and it was risky, because, and, and what I love about working with James is, it's like, hey, we're going to risk some shit, because we could shoot that scene in coverage, and then we know we're going to get a scene in the can. Mm. But instead, I'm like, I think we should do it as a Warner. And James like, you know what? Fuck it. We'll do it as a Warner. And maybe we're probably going to get it. Maybe we won't. But we just give ourselves over to it. And you're chasing, you're chasing, you're chasing. We got it. Focus ain't perfect, but, 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 <laughs> but we got it. Just to pick up for a quick second on that. Uh, my memory of that, too, was he, he the Steadicam operator, uh, sort of looked at us as one might, like, out of the side of the eye, like, well, you guys are crazy. By the end of it, he, he, we were like, oh, should we shoot a couple little pieces of coverage? And he was like, no. <laughs> and, and, and I don't think that was exhaustion. That was actually him going like, no, that was really good. Yeah. And it, I, I do remember that, actually. So, Joy, when you saw <laughs> this brilliance that they were shooting, um, what was your initial reaction to it? And I understand that you sometimes go in and start cutting before Barry sees it so that you have some material for him to respond to. Is that how you approach this project? Yeah, it's funny because the first day of dailies was actually the football scene with, and um, the shots were upside down. And I was like, oh. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Um, and then, but I <laughs> found out that the lens that they were using when you get the image that we were cutting with is actually upside down. Because I was like, do they know that this is upside down? <laughs> it but, shows how much Joy thinks of us. <laughs> Well, you remember I thought the flicker shot in the bathroom was a mistake as well. And you're like, no. We that would I remember. <laughs> I was hot with you. I was like, do you guys need to shoot this again? Um, but <laughs> and then I was like, Joy, we spent an hour just to get that flicker. <laughs> I That's right, Joy. Um, but no, once we got the um, the dailies, you know, turned right side up, I was like, oh my goodness, this is this is something special. Um, and that day, you guys weren't even actually supposed to shoot the football scene first, right? It was something with some actor's arrival. I forget who it was, because uh, Mahershala was doing a lot of stuff. He was doing Luke Cage at this time. He was doing this experimental film also. So he'd work in New York through the week, and then he'd fly down on like Friday and work Saturday, Sunday. It was, it was like... It was crazy what he was doing, but something happened. Yeah, we had yeah. to move that up to day one because independent film, you, you shoot it as you can shoot it. And uh, and so, yeah, we did all that football stuff. Um, yeah, it was pretty cool. Yeah, and I, rem I remember we showed Barry the movie for the first time. He was like, I was like, do you need a pad and paper? He's like, no, no notes. I don't need pad, I don't need pen. I was like, okay. So um, Matt, the other editor um, on the film, hit play. And uh, about two minutes in, and Bird's like, can I get a pad and pen? <laughs> 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 and, then, and then we hit play, and he goes, uh, stop. I'm like, oh. <laughs> and then <laughs> he was like, he was like um, well, I forget what scene it was, but he was like, he had, he remembered that when you were on a plane, you're talking about, we were talking about the transition. It was, so I'm, I'm terrified of flying, like terrified. Every time I get on a plane, I think it's the last time we get on the plane. <laughs> and right when we wrapped, I got on a plane to go to New York, and we, we shot the this, this scene with Naomi in the hallway with Little. We kind of just like, we just shot that. We didn't know what we were going to do with it. And I said to James, I just need some light coming out of this room. We're never going in there. He doesn't get to go in there, but the, the color of it is how he feels about his mom. And so James went and just chose that color. We shot it in slow-mo, and then I'm on this plane, and you know what the black box on, on the plane? So I'm in Miami, it's pouring rain, and the pl flight's delayed. We're sitting on the plane, and I see the engineer walking with the black box. The black box is orange. I know so much about planes. <laughs> I'm like, why the hell is he walking with the black box? So it just hit me, and I said, oh, I think between the second and the third chapter, we reverse Naomi coming out of the door, and finally, then we cut to 24 frames, and she yells, don't look at me. Because I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't tell anybody that was, that's what the footage was going to be, and I just dash this off as the plane's taking off. Because like, if I die, I want to make sure y'all know <laughs> that between the second and third chapter, Chiron finally sees this image again, and we hear what she yelled at him in the first chapter. Yeah. And then he was like, and he's like, and then the slate, you know, the slate with the lights, that part, recording it, like we're gonna change the color. And I was like, well, the slate, and I'm like writing it down. And this was like only five minutes into the film. He's like, I gotta tell you guys this right now. And so I'm writing it down. And I went through the footage and yeah, someone had rolled on, was it the, the slate of the? Yes, because whenever you spraying the actors, because we spray, we spraying people all the damn time. We're just spraying water on all our actors so they're glistening, shiny. And the AC would put the slate up against the lens. And depending on the focal length where we're at, we're anamorphic, you just see these blobs. It's like time code actually between each chapter of the film. It's literally time code passing between each chapter of the film. And I thought, oh, that's some cool shit. We should put that in between uh, the <laughs> chapters. But I didn't know. I just, James, James knows. We'll be able to say, I'd be like, just, just roll the camera, just roll the camera, just roll the camera. The steady cam will have the camera just sitting on the rig and it'll be wafting in the wind. I'd be like, oh, that's hot. Roll the camera, roll the camera, roll the camera. <laughs> but, but these slate blobs, these, these time code blobs, uh, we got that. Because as long as more, you just, just roll the camera. Yeah, I was, I just realized now, I should just give you the trigger. That'd be better. Nah, don't do that, bro. <laughs> don't, don't do that. Don't do that, man. We run out of hard drives left and right. <laughs> All right, so you just talked about spraying the actors. Can you talk more about that, about how, what you were going for in terms of the, of the quality of the skin that we were seeing, black skin tones, and we know that there are so many biases, problems, both inherent in the technology itself, but also the practices of cinematography, like, oh, no, you can't have a light person and a dark person next to each other. That, that's a 
a cinematographic problem. So why were you spraying them? <laughs> and what were you trying to achieve as a team as you were you know, thinking about um, shine, I guess? Yeah, uh, just my memory of growing up in Miami, people are shiny, man. You're sweating. Everybody got cocoa butter on, but everybody hot. And so it's like that combination. <laughs> But it's also beautiful, you know? We talk about magic hour up in the sky, but that light is also catching people's skin. And so, uh, you know, we shot this movie on Alexa. James and Alex Bickle, our colorist, got together. And, you know, we, did, we always do camera tests. And I remember that one, we did a camera test at, at Panavision. We brought in uh, those two young people. Remember that? Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, and yeah, we just oil folks up and set the curve where we set it. <laughs> and uh, uh, Donnie, who's more <laughs> famous than any of us now because she does the makeup on Euphoria and everybody's obsessed with her makeup. <laughs> uh, this was her first feature. And, uh, and myself, her, and James got together and just came up with, uh, we tested so many different oils on people's skin right. and different skin tones to see I don't know, I was chasing this memory in my head mm. of what beautiful black folks look like when I was growing up. Everybody just looked fucking beautiful all the time. Uh, because you're, you're sweating so much, your skin is like naturally, it's getting rid of all these things and it's kind of, it's just something just really beautiful about black folks in Miami. I thought, this is how it's gonna be. No powder, everybody's shiny <laughs> all the damn time. <laughs> and, and to his credit, man, he embraced it, man. That's why I love working with this dude, man. He just like, <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, yeah. And Underground Railroad, the camera's just going to be moving all the damn time. <laughs> all right, cool. Camera's moving all the damn time. We'll find a way. Uh, What'd you think of the I shine? Mean, yeah, yeah. Well, it, it just tells the story of heat, doesn't it? I mean, in, 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 in the city of Miami, which is a cl obviously a, a, a huge component of what the movie's about. Um, but yeah, I'll just, I mean, I'll say on a technical level, uh, I don't do, I mean, I've never put a flag in front of a more light-skinned person and, and of a light. I don't. We're pretty natural on the set. To Barry's point, the camera's moving a lot. There's nowhere to put things oftentimes anyway. Uh, but I would just say we we work in a time when you know, the latitude of these cameras is pretty incredible. Yeah, it's not. It's you don't need to mess with anybody. It, people's skin is beautiful as it is. Don't need to mess with it too much. But there is only one white person in this movie. <laughs> And they're like in the background. Yeah, in the like background, out of focus, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> you didn't really have to craft too many flags. <laughs> true, you made it easy on me, it's true. True. Joy, there is a beautiful quote that I found um, in which you said that the work of an editor is being the curator for the audience's experience. Mm. This is a lovely way to think about how your work in that, you know, edit suite will then relate to the experience of you don't even know how many people who will appreciate your work. Could you talk about how that concept of being a curator of the audience's experience, how that was guiding you as you were editing this film? Yeah, the scene that comes to mind is um, a lot of people, I actually did a talk with a Dublin Film Festival last week and someone brought up the diner scene and they're like, how did you work on the pace of that? Because it felt like they were in this in the diner um, with the two characters, and I think that's something that Barry and I spent a lot of time with that. But I also just watch that scene over and over again because I think the thing that Barry told me about that moment in the diner was there was an old friend that he um, had spent time with, and as you're spending time with someone that you haven't seen in a long time, the layers start to peel back. And so that the way we approached that scene was every time that they re-engaged with each other it was a little bit more vulnerable, a little bit more information that was given. They felt like they were able to say things that they weren't able to say, you know, maybe like 20 minutes before. Um, and I think as an editor, ultimately you are a storyteller and you are trying to create an experience that when people walk away from it, they're like, I want to go back to that. I want to revisit that. Um, and that's not easy to do, because especially nowadays, there's so many different outlets, so many different things that can catch your attention. So to present a film that people want to re-engage with over and over again is truly something that you have to take the time to craft in a way that is inviting to come back to. That's really powerful. Um, let's talk about the cast. And the casting process, could you tell us about how <laughs> you found this extraordinary group of 
men, young men, to play the characters of Chiron? Yeah, it was, oof. It was, I mean, I think it was, I think we, st we were five days from shooting and we, we did not have Jarrell Jerome. We had nobody to play the teenage Kevin. And uh, our casting director, Yessi Ramirez, uh, just reached out to high schools uh, all over the country. And Jarrell, now everybody knows he went to the same high school as Lynn Manuel. Uh, and there's a video of him and Lynn <laughs> uh, in, uh, singing The Heights or something. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it was it was wild, man. We we thought if we could find all the Chirones, then we could find all the Kevins. Or we thought, oh, we have to do chemistries. We got to find both the adults and the teenagers and read them together. And it's like, oh, that's not going to work. Uh, we quickly realized we didn't need to find people who looked exactly alike. Although when you line um, Alex and Ashton and Travante up, they kind of do start a little bit especially Travante and, uh, and Alex Hibbert. Uh, those cats really look alike. Um, but it was just one of those things, man. It was like everything with this movie was feel. And we were just trying to find folks who felt right. Um, and Ashton Sanders was the first person cast. Then went Ashton, Travante, uh, and then uh, Andre. And then we found Alex in Miami. Thank God. Oh, my goodness. We found Alex in Miami. But... It was just uh, because nobody knew who the hell we were. Um, and so we were just throwing rocks into the ocean, you know, and hoping it would hit something. And uh, eventually, I think the way we always work is we just have faith. It's like I always tell uh, the kids I, I, I mentor, just get to day one. Just get to day one. And when you get to day one, just get to day two. When you get to day two, just get to day three. We just have the feeling of we just got to get to Miami and just start shooting. And somehow, I think Janelle we cast in the last week, Alex Hibbert, Jarrell Jerome, all those folks came to us in like the last week before production started. And it was like, we just got to have faith that we're going to find the right combination of, of people. And it's operating on feel, you know, not on ability or anything like that, just, just purely feel. So James, when you were working with these sets of actors, what was that interaction like in terms of some of them had no film experience before, right? So then what the, the pro they were learning? <laughs> Um, how did you work with this range of talent? Well, I mean, I'm not sure how much film experience I had at the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it, we were all learning together, and I think that's, that's sort of, I think, was key. It was um, listening to each other. It was, you know, if, if Alex needed something to make him comfortable, we wanted to make sure that he was. We had a great second AC, actually, I remember, that was, uh, was older than all of us and much more of a veteran than all of us, and he really took a liking to Alex. What was his name? Uh, he loved that dude. Yeah, yeah, I forget his yeah. name right now, sorry. He loved that dude. That's what I love about making <coughs> movies. The dude he's talking about is like a 47-year-old white dude from Central Florida. This was Alex Hibbert's best friend in the making of this film. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wild. And, I th you know, but it, we, I think, you know, what, but, but what Barry's also not saying is just the kind of communal experience that Barry curates on a set. And um, while I'm sure that 4-year-old white dude didn't know what the heck we were talking about most of the time, he eventually, uh, through the course of the first week or so of the film, probably just realized, you know, he was going to get taken care of and be part of this experience and be part of that kind of family mentality that I mentioned earlier. And I think once that happened, the friendship with Alex bloomed, um, you know. And I think I think even f even to c uh, collaborate with people like Naomi Harris and Mahershala, who obviously, you know, much more se seasoned uh, 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 professionals than than any of us were and, and are. Um, you know, they too, I think, bought into that sort of just, we're all here as equals and we're all just going to support each other through the making of this film. For you, Joy, when you're editing, does it make a difference or was there a different approach that you needed to use when you were really sort of weaving together the performances of actors that had a range of, of backgrounds? You know, one of the things that I initially noticed about Alex um, is in the first act, Chiron doesn't say very much at all. Um, but he was such a natural with expressing with his eyes. And um, just the way that he would look towards, you know, Mahershala, who played Juan, or when he was engaging um, um, with Janelle Monet, it was just, it, he, there was something about him that was just so honest and earnest that as an editor, um, I could always go to him for a great expression. Um, and that's something I feel like you can't really teach, to be engaging when you don't have a line to say, to be something that the camera just drinks up 
when you're just fo you're basically just watching and um, that's what Alex did so well um, and all of the actors were so good Andre Holland was just so natural and and he was so confident in the way that he um, you know he portrayed Kevin and I remember the way that um, when I was first working on this scene um, where black call or Kevin calls black right um, and I thought it was so cool the way that um, Barry and James decided to shoot the footage where you don't really see who Kevin is. You know, there's like shots of the phone and the light and it's panning. And so you as a, I was like, this is a great way for the audience to be kind of intrigued of like, what does Kevin look like? And I, the way I was thinking about it is like when Black heard his voice, he doesn't know what Kevin looks like. So the first like few minutes of that phone conversation, we're playing with you as an audience not being able to see what Kevin looks like and then he's revealed. Um, and that was one of the scenes that Barry and I worked on quite a bit because the two actors aren't in the same room. Mm -hmm. But it's this, this coming together after they haven't seen each other in such a long time, so. Yeah. Uh, I remember shooting the, in the just a diner scene story for a second. Um, at some point, you know, a movie set's full of equipment and lots of people are watching and it's there's cameras everywhere and a bunch of junk and stuff. And, and I remember, but th those actors were doing, I mean, I, they were so locked in. And I remember at some point taking my eye off the eyepiece and going, I don't know that they know we're here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> like I just thought, they were, I just got, they were just so connected over that the and table. It, and it wasn't because we were in the diner for like mm. three months. We shot that, <laughs> everything you see in the diner from the parking lot to inside and Andre's phone call, mm. two nights. Mm. The, the, all yeah. that, two That's nights. Incredible. That's all we had. Because we could only close that place for two nights. <laughs> wow. They were locked. They were just in. Yeah. They were just in. Yeah. Ooh, okay. Um, that's amazing. <laughs> I mean, the swimming also was a radically reduced amount of time to shoot that, right? Like, you just had a matter of hours or something? Yeah, we, we got there. And as some Virginia Key Beach, uh, as Miami will do, weather just came in. The forecast be damned. It just came in. <laughs> And, uh, and we were racing to get the scene before the 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 the, 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 war the weather came in. I didn't realize Alex Hibbert, he, his mom's Jamaican. I didn't, he grew born on an island. I didn't realize he didn't know how to swim. Um, but I guess as a kid, I, didn't, I wasn't taught how to swim either. Mm. And so uh, we just said, oh, Mahershala, can you just teach, <laughs> just teach him how to <laughs> swim? And I was like, whatever you say, we gonna record. And, uh, and a lot of that shit he's saying is not in the script, you know? Uh, wh what's the line? Y you in the middle of the world, man. Yeah. <laughs> not, not scripted. That's just, that's just for Herschler <laughs> teaching his kid uh, <laughs> how to swim. Uh, but the thing I remember most about that day, though, was then it did pour for like five hours. And we're only shooting with available light. So then afterwards, we had to come back and do the scene where they're sitting on the bench and, mm -hmm. and he's telling the story. And I've got on James's nerves because <laughs> uh, James is shooting the scene. I'm running around with the viewfinder trying to figure out the next angle uh, because we had to rush so much. James is like, it's fine, Barry, it's fine. We got time. Um, and then we came up with the line of, um, um, you can't let no, uh, only you could decide what you, don't care, nobody made that decision for you. Yeah, yeah. Not scripted. We, we just, we got to the end of the scene. I thought it has to go a little bit farther. Mm. And then we also shot on that day, the very last shot of the film, which you guys just saw. Um, and I remember, um, uh, our one of our producers, Mark Sariak, is in here somewhere, because hey, and I love that. Again, he also went to film school with us. Mm. If you got a note, I will try it. I will try it because what happens is little is in the script. He's meant to swim out into the ocean because Herschler taught him how to swim. That's his lesson. He now he knows how to swim. He can swim out into the abyss. But we got there, and it was like uh, the sun had just was going down, and we had these uh, lifeguards, these salty dogs. And uh, the guy, I said, I said, hey, well, what are we going to do? I said, oh, the kid's going to swim out into the ocean. He's like, no, he's not. I was like, what? <laughs> he goes, oh, no, th there's, there's sharks out here, man. And, and this is exactly the time. This is exactly the time when they feed. And they like little people. So, so he's not doing that. I was like, oh, you, la you laugh, right? He's like, no, no, I'm dead serious. He's not swimming out there. And so what we did was, I should not have done this, because I was like, I was steadfast. We got to have this moment. Oh my God. I was like, he's going to start walking out, and we're going to rack the exposure. And so in the actual footage, Alex Hibbert gets there, he looks back, then he turns away, 
he takes like five steps and we rack to black, which we should never have done because <laughs> it's digital. We could have just taken it to black yeah. uh, in post. <laughs> but uh, we had been cutting the film, cutting the film, and then Mark, who's somewhere in here, Mark watched it and Mark said very simply, and it was a, he dropped the mic moment, he's like, I don't think he should look away. I was like, what? He's like, I've been on this whole journey with this film and I don't want that kid to look away. I, I love looking at him because I know him now. And I thought, oh shit, that's a good note. Mm. And so that's how we got the ending of the wow. film. <laughs> Thank you, Mark, or wherever you are out there. <laughs> Appreciate you, bro. There he is. Appreciate you. That's fantastic. I want to ask you one last question, and I hope that each of you might get to sort of reflect on this. You're five years beyond the nominations and the wins, and I wonder if you could talk about what those wins, what the nominations mean to you now. James, you can <laughs> kick us off. <laughs> I think I think that it, it just gives you a little bit of confidence, probably. I mean, I don't know that's much more than that. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> I, I, yeah, but I, don't, I mean, I don't know. What, what more does something, what does a, a nomination mean more than just saying, keep going? Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, uh, just don't stop. Mm. That's probably about it, really. Um. I think it, it's interesting because I didn't know that I would be the first black female nominated in the editing category. Um, <laughs> yes. Yes. So I, the, I guess the nomination means to me, but also to um, other black females who are you know, working in editing, I think it, the nomination means to them that there's the possibility, you know, mm -hmm. doors have been opened, mm -hmm. a light has been shown. And so I think that's one of the things that um, I appreciate about the nomination is showing that how much further we still have to go, but also showing that it is possible. Yes. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Um, I, I didn't drop out of film school, but the, the <laughs> first semester there was really hard because uh, uh, this guy, Wes Ball, who's a good friend of ours, he was in our class. He was in my class. And I went to the dean and took a year off from film school because I thought, I'm not as good as everybody else. Um, I need to learn how to do this. And so I did my own sort of uh, self-driven self curriculum. I tried to learn how to develop 35 millimeter film by taking stills in the dark room and doing all this stuff. And then I came back into film school, but I always remember that moment when I thought, this shit is beyond me. You know, I'm the kid who I grew up poor with a mom addicted to crack cocaine uh, from the projects. Everything you see in this film, I people like me don't make movies. And I always remember that moment when I said that and then I thought, nah, you know what, shit, let me just take some time to figure it out. Uh, and and then I, g I got through it. Now, the, the, that film school is up there, right? USC or U UCLA, wherever it is. <laughs> So when the nominations uh, came out for this movie, I'm not going to talk about the win, because you already cracked that joke, so I don't get to crack <laughs> it. Um, when, when the nominations came out, I was in Amsterdam, because I was touring around with the film, and it was like 3 in the afternoon for me. It wasn't uh, 5 in the morning, and I was really tired from traveling. And so my publicist, my awesome publicist, Paula Woods, she was in the hotel. I said, Paula, I don't want to watch when this shit happens. I'm going to take a nap. And she said, okay, Barry, um, but if there's, if there's a nomination, how do I contact you? I was like, oh, slip a note under the door. So I went to sleep. I woke up. I woke up. And I went to the fucking door. And I looked down, and all my friends' names were written on these <laughs> slips of paper. <laughs> Every time my nomination came in, she wrote it down individually. Yeah. I had Joy's name. I had Nat's name. I had James's name. Yeah. I had Adela's name. These kids I went to fucking film school <laughs> with, man. And it nothing, nothing, not being on stage, mm. nothing felt as good as looking down at those papers and all of my friends who went home to my hometown to make this movie. It was like nothing. I mean, nothing. I would have never dreamed that when I was sitting in, in a theater like <laughs> that group back there. I would have never dreamed that. And it was fucking real. And I thought, you know what? Just for a moment, I thought, Damn right, man. <laughs> that shit felt good. So, I don't know. That's that's what it means to me, man. Just yes. that we had a dream and we followed it together. You know. Yes, yes. Well, thank you. Thank you for having that dream.
Thank you for building this dream. Team. I have a dream. Here we go. It's Black History Month for one more day. So, and thank you all for being here I'm, for I'm this start conversation. I'm going to start singing Luther. Watch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> what is it? A home no. is not a home. <laughs> no, no, it, it's, so it's well. a chair. It's not a chair, right? <laughs> When there's no one standing there. Oh, no. <laughs> this, this, is, this is how we make all these sad ass films. We just laugh all the time. <laughs> I ain't gonna sing no more, Joy. Okay. I apologize. <laughs> thank you for singing, Barry. Hey, thank you all for coming out, man. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.